hey, thanks for coming by the workshop today. I'm gonna to show you how I made uh, these two very, very simple uh, miniature sort of warehouse style windows. We did two different methods, but using the same materials um, and uh, just two ways of looking at approaching materials and how to use them to kind of come up with your own ideas. So this is just kind of to go over the concepts that might be applicable that you might not be aware of uh, to get you started on your miniature window making journey. So in my shop, I keep boxes and trays and boxes of all kinds of scrap and spare materials that I hold on to. So you can see I keep uh, pieces of packaging that I like from things that I unbox. This is like stencils and different types of interesting paper. And uh, I've got like dollhouse pieces. I've got uh, different pieces of cut off cork, different kinds of, uh, I've got a whole drawer of googly eyes and little styrofoam things and cardboard shapes. There's Michael. Hi, Michael. One of the things though that I also keep is different densities and thicknesses of different types of cardboard and poster board material. And in that same drawer, I keep large pieces of clear plastic that I can use for things like windows. So this is from a, a, an action figure. I cut this off because the rigidity of it was pretty good. Um, these big old thick pieces of plastic are from graded comic books that I cracked out of their slabs. And these are the inner wells from those graded comic books. This is a pretty nice plastic. And uh, different types of like lucite and clear styrene-like stuff like that. So here's another clear piece from that same comic book thing. And let's see what else we got in here that's clear plastic. These are from little magnet holders, so maybe for some smaller windows, things like that. You don't have to do it with this same plastic. Just find something that you think is nice and sturdy. Why don't we go ahead and use this um, piece of plastic from the packaging just to kind of demonstrate um, how uh, how we can do with one of these, how well it works out. Because we're going to use a couple of very cheap, easily accessible materials. And this is something that I know most of you, uh, if you haven't thrown away, you come across these from time to time if you're unpacking action figures. Why don't we grab some cereal box cardboard as well and see what we can do with that. You going to lay there? You going to lay there? Oh, hello. Hello. I love you too. All right, so we've got our clear plastic from our action figure, and we've got some cereal box uh, cardboard that I saved. We've got some Frosted Flakes, some Fruit Loops, and some Cocoa Krispies. And I have this box that is pretty much the same basic type of cardboard uh, from an envelope uh, package that I saved. So we'll see what we can do out of just these simple materials to make ourselves a miniature window. So first things first, there's two ways to approach this. If you already have the size of the window that you need for your diorama or your miniature or your display or whatever you're doing, you of course want to try to find a piece of plastic that has a open or blank piece of clear plastic that you can utilize that is the same size. Or you can make your window first and then make your diorama to fit the window. That's kind of what we're going to do this uh, this time here. We're going to just make a custom size window that we could put into a piece later or kind of like prefab or prefabricate a window. So we got to look at the available space. I'm not going to worry about peeling this plastic off yet because it's going to leave way too much residue for me to deal with. I'm just going to basically salvage this this section over here. So it'd be good to take a ruler and just kind of see how much we have. So basically the maximum width that we have is about about four and a half inches. I always want to round down so we can do some trimming. And then this way we've got about eh, about four and three quarters, maybe just a little under four and three quarters of an inch. So at this point it's wise to just maybe trim off the stuff you're not going to use. And I'm just going to do, do this roughly. I'm not worried about perfect dimensions and perfect dimensional cuts yet. I'm just going to cut off this sort of uh, overhang here. All right, so now I'm going to go ahead and determine a, determine a final size and shape for this. Let's make a rectangular window just because it will be maybe a little bit more visually interesting. And I'm going to pick maybe my shortest side and cut based on that. So I'm going to line this up on my cutting mat. Cutting mats are extremely helpful when you're doing stuff like this. So I'm going to kind of get this roughly lined up with some uh, with a corner, a 90 degree corner here. And then I'm going to go ahead and actually use a razor knife or an X-Acto blade, I should say. Careful, guys, if you're under 18, get your parents' permission for this. And always be careful. So I'm using a metal ruler. It's always best, in my opinion, when you're using sharp objects to cut with. I'm going to go ahead and just score this plastic a few times on that straight line, the vertical one. Cuts right off. And then I'm going to actually twist this here. 
and we're going to line up this straight line we just cut with a line on the cutting mat again and then cut off this straight line here. Should probably do it this way. Line up this straight line up here on the cutting mat, overlap it on this line, see how it's uneven, and then we'll use this line to trim off the excess on this side to create an, a first 90 degree angle here. So we have some straight lines, square, parallel, perpendicular, just like a real window. Just gonna score this a couple times until it pops off. You could also score this and then uh, fold it, break it off. Now that we have this 90 degree corner, we can line it up over here and trim off the excess on this side. I'm going to go ahead and go in a little farther here. And if you don't already know, uh, at least in, in America, standard window uh, sizes or ANSI, American National Standards Institute, or the UBC, the Universal Building Code, has a lot of window sizes standardized at like in foot dimensions, so three foot by five foot, or two foot by two foot, or six foot by four foot, right? So if we're gonna do this same one twelve scale, a very common action figure scale, if we divide uh, feet into inches, we get units of one inch equals a foot. So what I mean by that is if we're doing a three foot by five foot window, it would be three inch by five inches to get our miniature scaled window to the same size window in real life. So now that I've cut off a few of these sides, we can determine a width here. And every two of these squares is one inch on my mat. So we've got one inch, two inches, three inches, four and a half inches. So four and a half inches in a real, you know, real dimensionally, four and a half inches scaled up from in one twelve scale back up to life size would equal, uh, let's see, four inches would be 48 inches because that's four feet, which is 12 times four is 48. And then another six inches. So that would be 54 inches, which is not a normal window size uh, unless it's like a weird custom modern home. You know, it's got some off size windows. So I'm going to go ahead and cut this off at the four inch mark for a 48 inch wide window or a four foot wide window. If that's making sense, I hope it is. If not, tell me in the comments below and I can clarify your questions about scaling at least from uh, life size to 1 12 scale using American standard measurements is quite easy because everything is divisible by 12 and 1 12 scale, that makes it really easy. So you see, I just scored this two times. I can just bend this off all the way and it should basically yeah, peel off for me once I do that with this type of plastic. So we've got a four inch window going this direction, right? Yeah, so there's our four inches or our four feet. And then this uh, way we can, again, I think I said I wanted to do a rectangle to make it more interesting. So let's go maybe three inches in this direction. So we got one, oh, I should probably turn it this way, shouldn't I? So we've got one, two, and three. So we could do a four by four window, but I think doing a square window might be a little bit less interesting. So we're gonna go ahead and go rectangular, just so there's some visual eye appeal, not to be so regular and square, but a little bit less regular. And we're gonna go ahead and score this. And now I have this little piece here. And I always save my scraps. This is a square scrap. And what I mean by that is I have one, two, three, four 90 degree corners. So this is already cut for me and I could just take this and I could make a one by four uh, side light window like next to a door, or I could flip it and make a transom, a window that goes above a window, right? Or I could use this for like paneling inside of a vehicle or visor material on an action figure. So here is our three by four inch or three by four foot 112 scale window. One, so we got here in the corner, starting here in the corner, one, two, three, starting here in the corner, one, two, three, four. Three foot by four foot or three inch by four inch, right? Because in one twelve scale, a foot is 12 inches. So everything is one foot equals one inch. Very, very easy to scale things in one twelve scale. So now what we want to do is we want to decide. There's a few ways to tackle adding uh, a frame and mullions. That's what the divisions in between uh, window glass is called. If you want to do mullions and not just an outer frame, they're called mullions. M-U-L-L-I-O-N-S, I think. And uh, so there's a few ways we can do that. We can actually do each line of the mullions and do lines around the frame as far as cutting the material and gluing it on. 
or we could cut another piece that's this big out of our cardboard and cut out every individual square. Now, that one does look nice when it's done, but it can be very, very easy to mess up and have to start over. So maybe we'll see if we can do one on one side and a different method on the other side, just so you guys can see the two different versions of how you can go about doing this. And of course, there's many other ways. If you've got 3D printers, laser cutters, stuff like that, you can go about this completely vastly different ways. You can use different materials as well, but I'm trying to show you stuff that you might have lying around the house, like empty cereal boxes where you can just cut them up and go nuts. So the first one we'll do maybe the trimmed out squares of the larger piece, and you'll see what I mean as we do it here. If you're confused, just stick with me. And uh, we'll cut a piece out, trim out the squares, and then for the other side, we'll go ahead and uh, cut individual strips. So first thing we need to do is cut some envelope, card envelope box cardboard off here that is bigger or the same size as our window. So I'm just gonna cut a little bit bigger than it, like this, keep that, and a little bit bigger than this. And again, another good scrap to keep around. Actually, we might use that on the next pass. And so there's uh, two ways you can do this. You can measure this out like here on your cutting mat, like I did where you put the ruler down and you trim off the edges, or you can simply, now that you have it, I'm gonna flip this over so it's a little visually more uh, simpler for me to sort out. You can literally just put this down and as long as you keep everything lined up, you can score along the edges you already created, as long as you don't go over onto this, onto your clear plastic and just trim your cardboard and use your plastic as your straight edge and then you know it will be perfectly, correctly the same size. Imagine that. This is a little tricky if you've never done this before. And I recommend if you are if you don't know how to do this well or you have shaky hands and you can't keep your thumbs far away from your blade, get your metal edge ruler or measure it out. Even use scissors, you don't even have to use a knife. All right, I'll show you another way you can do it with scissors. So, <clears throat> so this already just slid out of place. So I'm gonna reline these corners up here and then I'm gonna carefully lay this down and I'm gonna take a pen I like using fine point pens for this unless I have a very, very sharp mechanical pencil. Okay. I'm just gonna write, drag my pen here, give myself a line. So you could just trace all the way around it and then get your scissors out. These are some cheapo sharp scissors that I like to use. I use and abuse scissors all the time. So I have like 20 different pairs of scissors you'll see in videos, depending on how sharp they are or aren't or if I use them to cut metal or cardboard. And since you want to cut the line off of it because your line that you drew was on the outside edge of the acrylic or the plastic or the lucite, whatever plastic you end up using. So you want to cut the line off and then it will line up, should line up perfectly. So there we go. There's our nice uh, same size cut piece of packaging cardboard. Okay, so now is the tricky part where you have to do a lot of layout on this if you have a complex window. If you don't have a complex window, you'll see how easy this method could be. But if you have a complex window like I'm going to do just to kind of demonstrate for you guys the possibilities, um, this can take a little bit of time. So bear with me here, but it'll all make sense as we do it. And because I'm gonna be painting over this in the end, I'm not going to use this pen. I'm actually gonna switch back to a pencil for this part because I found that using a pen, um, sometimes the ink is so strong or so bold, whether it's black or blue or red, it actually can bleed through the paint I've seen sometimes. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this pencil and I'm just gonna sharpen this really quick. I'm just gonna do it with my X-Acto. Who needs a pencil sharpener when you have an X-Acto? This is the OG pencil sharpener right here. I am going to start drawing grid lines all the way around this uh, that line up with where I want my divisions in my window or my mullions, as I said before. So I'm gonna go about an eighth of an inch wide. I'm just gonna visually guess this one. If you wanna be ultra precise, you can, but I trust myself because I've done this a lot. So I'm just gonna give myself eighth of an inch lines from the outer edge, one, about an eighth of an inch or maybe a hair over an eighth of an inch from the outside to get my window frame, right? So probably, we're probably about a hair over an eighth of an inch, probably about a 32nd over an eighth of an inch. So what is that, a 32nd over an eighth of an inch? 
is about what eighth of an inch two sixteenths four thirty seconds five thirty seconds of an inch that's what that is again i deal with small measurements all the time so you get faster and faster as you do it and now since this is three inches i'm going to divide this evenly into three so i'm going to do a mark using my cutting mat at that first one inch and that first other inch but I want my mullion division to be centered on this point. I don't want to draw the second line above it or the second line below it because then it will be off centered with the splits. So you'll see what I mean here. So I want to go a 16th of an inch outside of this line. And then I want to go a 16th of an inch on the other side of this line. You see how, well, that's a little off, but you see how now this line is in the center so I need to bring this line a little bit farther back over. I should have twisted it around. I got in a rush. Don't get in a rush, guys. So I'm going to move this line back over. My eraser probably doesn't even work. Let me get my other eraser. This is another good reason to use pencil at this stage. You can erase your crime so you don't actually cut later on the wrong line. So I'm going to mark where I want to draw my line right there. And then I'm just going to visually line it up so my ruler is parallel with the other line that I drew. Bam. There we go. So now, the center of this division at the one inch mark, one inch, one inch, one inch, is in the center of this mullion window division. So same thing here. There's that, and then I'm gonna flip this around because I'm right-handed. I'm gonna flip this around so that my center mark stays where I want it and then I can see where I'm drawing my line rather than covering it with the ruler. Unless you have a clear ruler. If you have a clear ruler, go nuts. I have some clear rulers, but they're really big. They wouldn't be very practical for this. I'm gonna actually move that line over just a little farther, right there. So there we go. So now we have nice centered mullion divisions on our window, right? Cause we're gonna trim all these blank spaces out and glue this on top of our plastic. Okay, so I'm just drawing my offset from the center line division, reference, whatever you want to call it. I can't think of what to call it right now, sorry. And then I'm gonna flip this around. And these, again, these don't have to be absolutely flawless because where, what you need to be as flawless as you can be with is when you go to cut this with your X-Acto blade out. My dog is jumping around in the background on the boxes. So I don't know if you guys can hear that, but she's having fun too, climbing around the shop. And there's that. And one more. Okay, so see this one is a little bit thin, so I'll probably, when I go to cut, I'll go a little bit wider here. All right, so there is our window, and we're going to come back and we're going to cut out each of these squares. By the way, my hands and fingernails are dirty, not because I'm dirty, but because I paint. I get paint and I get stuff stuck under my hands, glue and paint all the time. So hang in there for me, all you OCD people. This is what artists' hands look like all the time. <laughs> uh, I'm not one of those OCD artists who is constantly freaking out about it. I'm actually just going to freehand this. I'm actually just going to freehand cut this because um, I can't see under my ruler and... When you're doing small, short distances like this, like less than an inch, as long as you have a steady hand, you can just do it like this. And it's not a big deal. Something to help you make sure you get all the cuts too is once you have a piece this way, do all the cuts you can do at this angle before you turn it. You could do one at a time and pop it out. I find though it's a little bit easier for me to keep track of what I've cut unless, and, and by doing every single vertical line I can do now. So you notice I'm starting in this corner that I drew and stop it at the next corner that I drew, right there. I'm not gonna cross over this line right here. I'm gonna leave that. I need that there so that I don't have to re-glue it later. The key is not to have to re-glue anything with this method or create seams. You're trying to create sort of seamless mullions. And again, you don't, you don't have to do it this way. The other way might be easier for you or more your speed. And the other way is, a, I, in my opinion, is a little bit quicker. But it depends on the look you want. Uh, this look has a sort of a cleaner look. The other look has more of a detailed look. I, I don't want to say it's dirty because it's not. It's got more detail. It actually has more lines in it. But depending on the type of window you're doing or the type of window uh, that you're trying to emulate or a look you want, and you can get very specific with this to look one way or the other in those close-up details, this is where you can, you know, channel your inner Bob Ross and make your little world whatever you want it to be here. So 
there isn't one method that I would say looks better or is better. Uh, it's about what you think you're comfortable doing with your hands and your knife that is safe for you and what you are comfortable doing uh, or what you think is going to look best for your piece, right? So it's, it's very subjective. There isn't a right way or a wrong way. There's just different ways. All right, you can see all those cuts that are made through there. I did all those vertical cuts. Now we can flip it this way and do all the horizontal cuts. And making sure I'm very careful not to cross across, excuse me, not to cut across those intersections of the lines. And believe me, you'll do it. I've done it. You'll do it. It's okay. It's not the end of the world. Just glue it back together when you go to glue it onto the piece of acrylic or before you paint it uh, so that once you paint it and you start layering things together, you don't have to fix it later because it can be hard to fix later when you glued things down. And it's okay as long as you're not cutting every intersection because then you're just going to be trying to reassemble a million tiny little pieces of strips of cardboard, which is not what we're trying to do on at least on this method. So there's a lot of guys out there who use 3D printers to create their window frames or they use um, laser cutters on different types of cardboard or wood. Those are all excellent methods as well. If you have access to things like that and you have the time to set that up and learn how to run your machines properly, that is something that I do want to be uh, using in the future for some of my projects, especially larger projects. It is very helpful. But to be honest, um, this really is a fairly quick method. As long as once you get comfortable with it, as you can see, we're moving along pretty quick here. And you can line these up and do it assembly line style and do like four at the same time as long as you know your window sizes and it's really not too big of a deal it just takes a few hours you know it's not a big deal at all so there we see we've cut our lines there's probably some corners that didn't get all the way in there which we'll discover when we go to pop these out but let's go ahead and start popping these out and we'll use our keep our knife close by so that we can uh carefully pop things out it's always wise by the way to recap your knife if you're not going to use it so you don't actually move your hand across the table and poke yourself or cut yourself you want to be careful of that all right so now we should be able to get in here and kind of pop things open and peel these out yep so we've got a little tear out right there that's not the end of the world i don't really worry about small ones like that it's when they get bigger where i get a little concerned i don't want them to be too obvious right so now i'm getting a little bit of resistance I'm going to pop the knife back out and I'm going to go ahead and retrace, there we go, retrace some of my uh, cuts that didn't go as deep as I thought they did the first time. Right here as well, no problemo. And this is where you just got to be delicate and hold things in place while you tear that piece out. And you can also, of course, use these for detail later, like maybe miniature tiles or something like that. There's always a use for scraps. Save your scraps. You'd be surprised what you can do with cut off materials that you didn't intend on keeping for the thing you're working on. Here we go. Bam. See, you can see how you can do other applications too for like doors or large doors of things using this same basic method, right? Sketch out or draft out your lines on your piece of cardboard or whatever material you're working with. You can do it with wood, you can do it with plastic, you can do it with acrylic, you can do it with uh, PVC, you can do it with uh, medium density fiber board, you can do it with chip board, you can do it with, uh, you know, whatever. Whatever you have access to that makes sense for you. Cardboard. That's the, that's the, I think cardboard is one of the easiest ones to have access to. And it's always fun to work with recyclable materials as well, because then, you know, you can feel good about the environment. Tore one of my intersections. That's okay. Once I put paint on this, it'll kind of weld it closed. That's a pretty nice tear too, right at a good place that will be sort of hidden when I get to it. So there is our basic window trim. And I can see a little things like this line here is a little uppity so i'm actually going to trim this again it's making a little scoop up and i don't want that yep it's going to trim that off <clears throat> make it a little straighter going to trim out some of this corner flashing or this corner tear out just to make it a little bit cleaner looking 
so you know yeah sometimes if you if you do it in a rush you have to clean it up but i always recommend people when you guys do these things like for the first time that you take your time just the first few times just so you get in the habit of doing things correctly and then when you start to move a little bit faster you won't make as many mistakes right so here we are i've been doing this now for a long time many years and i got a little tear out that's okay that's just the way it goes so when i go to hit go and glue that down or paint that and then i go and glue it down that'll tear out even though it's visible now probably won't even be able to tell it was ever there or as i like to say when i make little tiny mistakes like that i just say oh look accidental detail accidental weathering it's one of the greatest things that happens to your pieces don't try to fight it just go with it accidental weathering i'm just going to take this and put it on a piece of cardboard that another piece of scrap cardboard and i'm just going to shoot it with maybe two coats of like a flat uh, color i haven't decided gray green blue black i don't know maybe i'll go with uh like an olive green that i have over there I'll make it look like an old warehouse window i'll shoot a couple of colors a couple of, sp of uh, spreads of that on here and actually i might do it on this side because if i glue the shiny side down and you flip it around and when i do the other side you might be able to see the whites and the blues through on the other side so i could there's two ways i could approach this i could paint this side and glue the cardboard colored side down so that if there's any uh, viewable edging from the back side that it's a muted tone and it's not very obvious because like I said, if I glue it down this way, you might be able to see those bright white or blue edges if my uh, the other mullions I create on this side don't hide what's there. Or I could just paint both sides of this. The problem is if I paint the side I'm going to glue to this, I'm going to be gluing the paint to this instead of gluing the object to this. So I think I'm going to go ahead and paint this side and leave this side the color it is. All right. And you'll kind of see what I mean here again as we go to the next step. You'll understand why that's important. I'll be right back. All right, I just shot this with some spray paint and it's fresh, so we're gonna let that cure. But the next thing we're gonna do is create the other side of the window frame. And so there's a couple of ways to approach this. Since I painted this after I cut it out, if I'm gonna cut these in individual linear strips, like this strip, this strip, this strip, this strip, that strip, that strip, that strip, that strip I can't necessarily pin all those things down on a scrap piece of cardboard like I did here, spray them and not have them fly across the room and disappear forever. So there's a couple of ways to approach this. I could cut all those pieces and glue them down as uncolored, unpainted cardboard. And then I could put tape in between my window cells and then I could spray paint it and peel the tape off. Or what I could do is I could paint the cardboard first and then cut my strips off the cardboard and glue them down. Right? I'm just giving you some different methods. I'm only going to use one of these methods that I'm discussing right now. But that is an, uh, a couple of ways that you could approach this if you're uh, trying to figure out how to layer these things so that you have the paint colors and finishes you want by the end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and glue down the cardboard strips onto the acrylic and then I'm going to mask off the acrylic and paint it after it's, the glue has dried. All right, I'm more comfortable with that method. I think it looks better when it's done as well. So this is method one. We'll glue method one on once method one is dry and this other side is ready to go. All right, so let me show you what I'm talking about. Do that out of the same material. It's always wise to use the same material too. Like don't switch cardboard types. Like if you started with this, this envelope box material and let's say you the cereal box card material was a different density or a different weight or a different was a different type of material uh, or different thicker cardboard is what I'm trying to say or thinner cardboard and then you switch, uh, you might find that your piece doesn't look consistent. So it's always good to stick with at least the same type of cardboard when you're going from side to side. So, or not, whatever you want to do. It's your little world, whatever you make of it. So I'm not going to worry about... Um, trying to make things perpendicular and parallel because that'll happen as I glue things down. So I'm just gonna slice off this rough edge here. I'm gonna get it off my piece. Get out of here, you. And then I'm gonna cut roughly eight inch and I'm just gonna go ahead and eyeball it. I'm used to eighths of an inch. If you want to, you can take your ruler and you can put your ruler down on the edge here. You can mark every single eighth of an inch if you want. If you need to do that, go ahead and do that. I'm just used to doing these small measurements, so I just gonna, I'm just i going to go ahead and just eyeball it. I am comfortable with that. Uh, any, division, any dimension under about an inch and a half, I can usually eyeball within about a sixteenth of an inch. So there's our first piece of cardboard lumber. There's our 
is our second piece of cardboard lumber. And how many pieces did I say? About eight to 12 or so. Let's go with, let's just do like 10 cuts and we'll work with that. And then if we need to cut more or less, we'll discover that as we go. No big deal. So as I said at the beginning, keep in mind, this is not the way to make a miniature window or the only way to make a miniature window. This is a way to make a miniature window. You may have a better way that you like or a way that you're more comfortable with using different materials or even the same materials. Don't think that I'm telling you if you've been doing it wrong or you should do it this way. This is just a way. I have five or six different ways that I make miniature windows, and I will I promise I will share most of those over time as I have time to film those videos. But I figured this is the most accessible and the cheapest and easiest way to do this. And so I figured this would be a good starting point for most people, most diorama enthusiasts, miniature makers, people that want to make action figure displays for their toys. This is probably the easiest way to go about starting learning how to make miniature windows by hand. That is not automated or anything like that, just by hand. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten pieces of cardboard lumber. That's good. That's probably all we're going to need. So now, now that I have this cardboard lumber, I'm going to go ahead and glue, like I was saying before, I'm going to go ahead and glue the colored side out just so that um, it doesn't show through on the other side in case there is overlap or uh, underlap or something, you know, like, so if I'm looking through the clear glass or through the clear acrylic and uh, the piece doesn't match exactly size wise, I don't, I see an edge like that. That's a muted tone instead of an edge like that. That's a bright blue tone. You understand what I'm saying? You'll see when I'm done. All right, so now <clears throat> the cool thing about foam lumber without having a border that's like uh, preventing it, like we don't have a piece of anything that's stopping us where we have to cut exactly and lay it in. There's no piece. We can just move all the way over the edge here. We can just glue some of this stuff down and then trim it off when it's done drying. And we're going to use super glue. I recommend super glue for this process. Um, cardboard is very absorbent. And so if you use too little super glue, it will just soak into the cardboard and won't adhere very well to the acrylic plastic. If you use too much super glue, it'll squish out and it will seep into your window and you will see the glue on your window. And now some, to some degree, a little tiny itty bitty bit of that is going to happen, but it's really not something that's going to be problematic or noticeable. It'll actually kind of look like weathering in the edges of your window panes. You'll learn what amount of glue works good what good with what thickness and density of cardboard. That just kind of comes with practice. There's nothing I can really say about that other than what I just said. So you just kind of have to practice. And I would recommend if you don't have a lot of clear acrylic material around or uh, cardboard around, go ahead and just get some scraps and try to glue things together and just get a feel for the materials you're using. This is probably the super glue that I use the most often. I've got a link below if you want to pick this up off Amazon. It is an affiliate link, and I appreciate the support of the channel if you want to get yourself some of it. I do think it is cheaper on Amazon than anywhere else as well. Um, the super glue professional liquid, I use this all the time, and it's not super thin. It's not super thick. It's just the right amount, uh, just the right viscosity for most uh, projects that I need super glue for. I do have some thinner ones and some thicker ones for more specific instances, but in this case, this is a perfect glue for this. All right. So again, this stuff is dangerous. You can glue your fingers together. Don't get it in your eyes. Don't eat it. And the smell can even harm you. So if you are a minor, make sure you do this with your parent supervision and uh, wear a respirator if you are not in an open or well ventilated area. I have airflow through here. I have doors open and there's a lot of space around me. So I'm okay this time, but if I was really, really close in there, I'd definitely be wearing my respirator. Okay. <clears throat> so I recommend putting the glue on the cardboard, not on the acrylic, because it could run off into places you don't want it. And when you go to spread the glue onto the cardboard, don't do it over the acrylic, okay? Do it uh, over your cutting mat or over a scrap piece of material you don't care about ruining, so that if you drip glue down, it doesn't ruin your cutting mat, doesn't ruin your acrylic, all right? Just some tips of because of mistakes that I've made in the past. And if your cardboard happens to be very absorbent, this is looking quite absorbent, you can spread the glue on, let it dry, and then spread another layer of glue on so that the first layer of glue soaks in and impregnates the uh, cardboard with it. And then the second layer sticks it to the acrylic. So I'm just going to do this with this first piece. And I'm going to glue it down and I'm going to line it up with the outer edge here and this side of my acrylic sheet and just hold it in place 
line it up, press it down. Oops, so see like with that, with the shaking like I just did, you're gonna get a little glue bleeding over on the edge there, but trust me, it actually will end up looking like weathering in the end if it's just a little bit. So let me pick this up carefully. Do you wanna bend your acrylic because your, your cardboard piece could pop right off, but see that little bleed over right there? It's kind of hard to see, but right there, that will actually end up looking like weathering once we're done painting and weathering all this stuff. So don't even worry about that. Don't stress about that. Unless you're trying to be super OCD about it, in which case, do stress about it. See all those sort of shiny bubbly spots? That's where the card, the glue is not touching the acrylic. So I'm gonna go and I'm gonna just hold this in place and I'm gonna push kind of back and forth just to make sure the super glue gets contact with all the acrylic sheet. Yeah, there we go. So there's only, there's little minimal areas where there's air bubbles trapped in there, but that's not a big deal. So now we can go ahead and move on to the next piece. Same thing. Spread some glue on the cardboard. Just like that. I'm going to use the tip of the bottle to spread it evenly across the cardboard. I used it, I swiped it on this last time. I'm just going to use the tip of the bottle to spread it around. Doesn't really matter. You can even use your finger if you're very careful with it. And then you wipe your finger off immediately. And then we're going to line it up down here. Pop it on. And just put the pressure down. Whoops, Oops. slide it around. So you might find that your super glue starts to not cooperate. Oops, yeah. So there's some of our glue on there. I'm actually gonna give this a second to start curing because if it's a little bit too slippery, I might've put too much super glue on there. I'm gonna let this start to cure. Just give it a few, literally just a few seconds and then I'm gonna reapply it so that it'll have some, some sort of chemical tack to it. And super glue has to form these sort of chemical bonds on a molecular level. And if it moves around too much at the beginning, it'll take longer to dry because those bonds won't form as long of a chain uh, in the glue itself. And it'll be a weaker bond. So you wanna like, once you put it down in the right place, you just wanna like not touch it, right? Or not try to manipulate it. It's like my edge wanted to stick down there on my mat. That's okay. Yep, see, this is not cooperating. So what I'm gonna do because the glue is not cooperating with me, is I'm going to clamp it to the acrylic sheet. This is, again, here's one of the drawbacks of this method, is again, with super glue, once you move it around, those polymers don't form, or they're not chem polymers, but those chemical bonds don't form as well. It takes longer to dry. So I'm gonna get some little clampy clamps right here, and I'm just gonna clamp this down. So that it, obeys me there we go so now i don't have to worry about that so now i've got some of the super glue again this one's bleeding over quite a bit we can clean up some of that with some denatured alcohol here before we move on to the next step which i'll probably do i'm just going to let this cure <clears throat> and then there's two ways you can do this as far as trimming off the excess you can lay it down on your mat like this and put pressure and just cut off the excess piece like that or you can grab your scissors Put the edge of the scissor next to the acrylic and pop it off like that. Save your scraps. <clears throat> <clears throat> There's the beginnings of this, this version. Let's see if this is moving around. Nope, it's starting to bond. See, it, once, it, once you leave it and you get it in place, it starts to bond pretty quick. But if you move, like I said, if you move it around too much at the beginning, those uh, molecular uh, bonds don't have a chance to uh, form as straight of a chain or, or stack the way that they're supposed to do as they kind of have their reaction with the air. And so you can prevent it from curing very hard or curing uh, as quick as it's supposed to. So once you try to get it in place the first time, push it down, don't move it. Let it let it do its thing. So now we can see if we can clean a little bit of this off. We won't be able to, we won't be able to get all of it off, but we'll go ahead and finish this project as is just so you guys can see the result and you know what to be careful of. Uh, uh, and you know that I make mistakes too, so it's all right. It's all good. 
So I've got some denatured alcohol here. Uh, it says fuel because this is normally used for fuel, but this is also used by painters, as you can see here, to clean off different types of acrylic or plastic mediums or oil paints and things like that off of hard surfaces. This is works excellent for that. It is a chemical. Make sure you have an adult helping you or you are an adult. Check to see if you're an adult. <laughs> and I'm gonna use, in this case, I'm gonna use a microfiber cloth. You can also just use a paper towel. I have these around my shop for doing stuff like this. I'm just gonna get some on my cloth. And then I'm gonna go ahead and get in here and get some of this super glue off. See if I can get a little bit of it off. Yeah, it's coming off a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, little bit. Hey, just a quick note. Um, I mentioned denatured alcohol, but acetone actually works much, much better for cleaning super glue off of things. Uh, denatured alcohol works as well, but it's a lot less strong. Uh, denatured alcohol is great for pulling paint off of things, not so much glues, uh, but paint off of things. It actually works really, really well for pulling paint off of action figures if you want to repaint your figures. So there you go. Probably won't be able to get it all off, but yeah, some of it's coming off. And then you can get in there. I get in there with my fingernail and scrape it after I wipe it too. Sometimes it needs some encouragement. And you see that? It's even taking off the dye off of the cardboard, the paint dye or the ink dye, excuse me. This stuff is pretty fancy, pretty strong stuff. Do the other side. Just get it a little bit more, yeah, a little bit more cleaned up before we move on there. So there's scratches in it, but that's okay because glass gets scratches in it as well. It's all a whole part of the weathering. So now that I have these two pieces, I can do two pieces this way. I can do the frame, whatever you want to do. I'm going to go ahead and finish the frame sides. And this is where it's probably wise to go ahead and just trim these to size before you try to glue anything because it might not turn out the way you want if you do it otherwise. So I'm just going to go ahead and lay this in place and use my X-Acto to mark where I need to cut this piece and then cut it. See how easy that was? There we go. That one went down nice and easy. I'm not going to touch that now that it's on there. I'm going to let that start to cure. Line up my piece. Use my blade to mark. Just kind of back and forth. Also using my blade to pull it off of the piece. And just cut that piece off carefully. Don't cut yourself. That is lifting a little bit, so before that cure is lifted, I'm going to clamp it down so that it doesn't do that. And this side is lifting a little bit too. There we go. See, now that I clamped it, it's starting to squish out. So now, see, you can see on this side, we have this muted tone here. That's good because it doesn't draw attention to if we have any little crimes in the way we did our layout. Mullions, I'm going to do the longer ones first. And I'm just kind of guessing on my placement. I'll use my cutting mat to help me lay this out in a minute. I'm going to score this. See that little line I put in there? And then I'm going to trim that off. And I'm going to go ahead and do another one while I'm at it. I'm slowing way down here for you guys. Normally I'd be kind of just pumping my way through this. But I want you to see every little step. And I think actually slowing me down because I'm not sort of doing this through muscle memory is making me make a little bit of gluing oopsie. So forgive me for that. Sometimes when you slow down and you start to explain things, you start making the same mistakes you're trying not to make. But it'll all look good in the end, I promise. Just like I did when I drew my pattern on the other piece, I'm going to use my cutting mat to line up my uh, one inch divisions here. So there's my one inch. I want to want that on center. That one on center. So this one's gonna go on this side. So I'm gonna bring it over here. And I'm gonna put my glue <clears throat> on this cardboard. Okay. Not bad. I'm gonna make sure this is perpendicular and parallel with my cutting mat. And then I'm going to very carefully center this on that line at the one inch mark. There we go. That fell into place nicely. Now we will do this one. And I'm gonna line it up this way so you can see what I'm doing. On center with that line. 
Let's drop it down. So that's twisting up a little. I'm not gonna freak out about that too much. I'm just gonna push it down. You can see the glue is seeping out on the side over here. I'm not gonna worry about that. Not too bad. Certain materials, you could just overlap this if you wanted to. You could overlap all three and that could create some visual interest or you could cut every single little section, which is what we're gonna do for the sake of education. That's, look at that. Look, I tried to put the exacto cap on my super glue. My goodness. You guys gotta keep me in line here. I'll go ahead and just lay this in here. Cut it off. Very helpful. You could mark this all with a pencil and do everything with a ruler. I prefer the cutting mat method. It's just a little bit easier. And I'm not freaking out if these things are not absolutely perfectly flawlessly aligned. So these mullions, I'm sure you've noticed by now, are much bigger than the mullions on the other piece that we did. Oops. I'm not really worried about it. Maybe we'll make two windows instead of one with the each method on each side. We'll maybe we'll two two windows with two different methods. That might be a wiser course of action here. All right, so you guys may have noticed some of the other drawbacks of this method is that it's hard to keep things aligned vertically. Now, if you really slow down, you could do that, but it can be, from a distance, the things look fine, but once you get really close up, you can start to see this million is a little bit at, of at an angle, this one's at a little bit of an angle, and so on and so forth. But you could also argue that might add character to your, to, to your piece, depending on what your piece is supposed to represent. Is it supposed to represent something from a certain time period, a certain age, of a certain material? What not? I'm gonna wipe a little bit of super glue off there, right there. So, this is our painted piece, and this is dry enough to handle, at least for now. Should be. And we'll grab this. And you can see if we were to glue this to the other side of our piece here, you would see the mullions from the other side sticking through. You see that? We've got our mullion division sticking through the other side. But that can add nice, like I said, that can add lots of character to your piece or not. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna go ahead and do this piece separately. And I'm gonna glue this onto a new piece of acrylic sheet that I'm going to cut right now. The tricky part about gluing one of these grids down is if I spread super glue all over this piece and try to glue it down and it's not aligned, it's staying in whatever misaligned place I put it. So you could glue it to a piece that's bigger than your piece and then trim out the acrylic around it later, but you still run the risk of getting it on your fingers while you're gluing it down and gluing your finger to the acrylic and messing it up. So we're actually going to switch out glues for this one just to show you a different way to do this. The EPS glue. This is designed for foam and different types of craft materials. There's a link below for you to go ahead and get some EPS glue in a four ounce bottle. This is a big old 17 ounce bottle, so most of you probably won't need that. These things, I go through a lot of these things because I make a lot of big projects, but the four ounce bottle should be just fine. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spread a very thin layer of EPS glue across this, which is a little bit less volatile and dries a lot less quick, but also gets tacky fairly quick so that it will stay in position on my acrylic sheet so here goes nothing So with this glue, if I get a little bit of a bleed over like this, I can literally just wipe it off off my mat and 
kind of clean it up with my finger without worrying about creating a mess, as long as I'm careful. I'm going to go ahead and line up this uh, one side here, these two corners. Just carefully press them into place. And then I'm going to follow this outer edge over here near my right thumb, push that into place. Just kind of work my way towards the other corner here, just tapping things down into place. And we can, with this glue, we have a little bit of leeway to manipulate things around. Don't want to do it too much because we don't want to smear our glue around, but... Once we have it down, I'm gonna go ahead and flip it over and just kind of push like this, flip it back, and I would say we're good to go with this one. So you got two very different methods that can be used for different applications. This method works really well on less detailed windows, but I wanted to show you sort of the different types of outcomes that you get. This method works good if you wanna have like sort of clean edges in between all your window panes and things like that. And of course we did this one in a rush. You could slow down and make this a little bit finer if you wanted to. But now I'm gonna go ahead, since this seems to be nice and dry we'll go ahead and mask off this one and i'll show you the fastest way to do that i'm going to go ahead and use this light duty frog tape all right or well this is the light duty scotch tape but that yellow and green stuff like this is the frog brand scotch tape that uh, works really really well for the same thing i'm going to go ahead and just i'm just going to go ahead and put the tape right over the glass here and you'll see and it's important to use the light duty stuff because the heavy duty stuff can mess with, oops, that's not. It's important to use the light duty stuff because the heavy duty stuff can really mess with uh, your acrylic sheet. It can kind of stick uh, maybe a little bit harder than you want it to and leave a residue. So get the light duty stuff, either the green, the yellow, or the purple, all right? And now I'm gonna go ahead with my X-Acto knife and very carefully, trace all the inner edges here and I can do this kind of quick because all we're doing this for is to peel off where we don't want to mask the acrylic sheet so we're just creating a mask Oop, I don't want to peel that part off creating a mask for our fake glass okay now I'm gonna go ahead and peel this off and carefully make sure I don't take my window panes with it, my window pane masks with it. And I'm just gonna start and make sure these corners stay down in the glass. So far so good. couple spots over here where it didn't want to cooperate with me so I'm gonna go ahead and just lay down a new piece do another cut nothing wrong with laying a piece over a piece it's not gonna hurt anything Even though you might be thinking to yourself, wow, this method looks way more cumbersome than the other method. Well, at this scale and this size of a window, you might be right, but you might find yourself using techniques I've used in this uh, process for other applications, things that they would work well for, like masking off uh, painting lines in a wall or on a floor, um, or doing this on a large scale window could actually be very beneficial rather than trying to cut out a very, very large piece, like starting with an enormous piece of material and trying to trim out every little window using this linear method of doing line by line might work much better on a larger window so this is again this is really just meant to show you different variations using the same materials and how you can go about it uh, if you uh, are having trouble thinking of ways of doing things it's not meant to say this is the best way or the only way this is just a way and this is just a way so now that i have masked this off enough to where i'm comfortable with it we can go ahead and spray paint this. You can see there's still some slivers and lines of things, but I'm not really worried about that here at this scale. It's not gonna be super visible. Um, and some bleed over is reasonable, especially on like older windows where they go in and they paint over the mullions with a brush. 
we might get paint bleeding over. And we can clean that paint off with the denatured alcohol as well if we need to. So I'm gonna go ahead and spray this. Maybe I'll spray this one a different color. We did this one in an olive. Maybe I'll do this one in like a gray. And I decided to go actually go with a silver and black look to make it look sort of like a galvanized or a pewter or a hammered steel. Um, I This is a method I sort of accidentally discovered years ago where you paint flat black down. And while the flat black is still wet, you lightly mist a metallic, whether it's gold, metal, copper, silver, whatever, over the flat black. And as the flat black layer cures, it pulls the metal flake apart and makes it almost look like a galvanization or like it's been galvanized or like it's hammered metal without having to use a hammered paint. So I'll show you guys what this looks like when it's dry and we'll peel off all the little layers of masking that we put on it. So we'll be right back. Okay, giving this a chance to dry and cure to the point where we can at least handle it. And we can peel off our mask, which is the pinky purple tape, the uh, sort of faded magenta tape. I'm gonna go ahead and use my X-Acto to reach those corners, peel them off. It's also good sometimes to peel those off before the paint is fully cured, because when it's fully cured, if you peel it off and the paint that overlapped from the mullion or the edge of your frame over onto the paint, or onto the tape, excuse me, and you peel it off, it could peel off your paint from uh, your actual thing. You don't want the paint coming off of whatever, whatever, however you choose to mask it off. So it's good sometimes to peel off the masking before your paint is 100% cured. So we're gonna go ahead and do that now. There's our first one. We see we got a little bit of overspray in here, but we can, again, we can, some of that looks good. Some of that looks like weathering like over here, but that, like this, we can either clean up by scraping it, right? Or we can get a, a Q-tip and some denatured alcohol, whatever we wanna do. We'll see how it looks when we're done peeling it all off here really quick. There's another one. I'm just kind of finding an already lifted edge or a corner and just kind of peeling it back pretty straightforwardly. You can you can see what I'm doing, right? Not too complex of a dealio. Another thing that I'm noticing too about this paint style that I did, instead of painting it like a solid color like we did this piece up here, giving it this two-tone sort of spackled, speckling, uh, hammered metal, galvanized, whatever you want to call it, look, it actually is hiding a little bit of the inconsistency and in the thickness of some of my cuts my from my cardboard lumber. And it's also hiding some of the uh, angular imperfections. These are little ways in which you, as you layer things up, you think you might think in your first pass of cutting and gluing and assembling that something looks terrible. But by the time you finish adding all the layers of effects, whether that's more material or paint or weathering, things start to look really, really good later on. So you have to, you do have to kind of trust the process. You have to be patient and trust the process and not just assume the whole thing's gonna look bad because maybe there's a little couple little flaws that you notice at the beginning. So this is, a, I think, is a good example of that. This is looking still looking pretty cool to me, regardless of the flaws that I know are there. But again, to each his own. You might want to just take your time, weigh a lot of time on that first layer. I know if I was doing a, a commission for like an industry professional or something like that, I would definitely take be taking a little bit more time to make sure that things are a little bit more careful uh or maybe if i'm doing a dilapidated building or like something that looks like a you know a, a building that needs restoration i wouldn't be as worried about it because it might fit the scenery you know so again there's different ways of dealing with the processes and letting them uh, have some degree of sort of naturalness instead of trying to be super ocd about everything the sometimes the trick is not worrying about it and the naturalness and the weathering and shaping and um, how it comes together ends up working to your advantage in the end. And a lot of that just comes with experience and doing things over and over and over again. You start to see the things you may not be to, need to be as concerned about, things you don't have to worry about, things that didn't turn out the way they, you thought that you wanted them to. You might realize, oh, nah, it's not, not as big as the concern as I thought it was. So we've got some little oversprays in here. Flip that over. We've got our um, back there. And, you know, if we put these together, you don't see the green one behind it. But if you flip it this way, you see 
the other one behind it. And that doesn't look too bad either. Even if you did it like that, you know, let's say this is like an upper warehouse window, that would not really look too bad, uh, even the way that it is, even though I would normally add more weathering and things to these. So <clears throat> now there's an option at this point. We could add more weathering to this. We could add washes to this, even onto the glass to make it look old and weathered. Or we could glue this into our piece the way it is. We could add things behind it to light it. We could put pieces of like paper and things like that that would uh, could be backlit. Like for example, like for example, if you put a piece of paper behind this, you could add light behind it and get interesting light up effects. See that, how we've got some light behind it now? There's your no light and your light. Your no light and your light. Right, there's all kinds of different materials you can fiddle with to achieve these effects. Paper is just one of many. Maybe we'll do a little bit of weathering on both of these with some uh, dirty paint water and maybe some oranges because oranges uh, can help us kind of look like, uh, give us rusty effects and we'll call it good. All right. So I am literally just going to smear this all over this and then I'm going to go back and wipe it off before it has a chance to start curing. And you can experiment with different colors. I just know that orange, uh, just even just plain orange or orange mixed with some darker reds, uh, can really is a really simple way to add just sort of a quick rust effect to things. And again, this is this bright, bright orange is like a you know it's sort of a fresh but advanced fresh rust look. You know, depends on what you're doing it on, right? It, it works well for like antiquing on things as well, like. Um, things that look like they're sitting outside in the desert rusting, big pieces of metal. I'm just gonna come in and wipe this right off and get a, yep, there we go. And something that now too to pay is to pay attention to the direction that your windows are. If they're this way, you wanna swipe this way at the end. If they're this way, you wanna swipe this way. So it'll look like your weathering or moisture weathering uh, as it hit the glass has weathered off in a direction that makes sense with gravity, with the gravity of your piece. So I'm just, we've got some sirens going on in the background, sorry. I'm just gonna have to live with that. But I'm just kind of circle, circling these to get the bulk of the paint out of the glass but leave residue. And now I'm gonna go ahead and do it this way. And I'm just going to, I'm actually gonna come back in here with a, my wet brush with some of this orange on it and just drip it in like this just to get some more moisture on there. And then I'm gonna come back with my uh, rag and wipe it again in one direction so that the weathering makes sense from a moisture drippage standpoint. Yeah, so go ahead and leave that the way it is. And then I'm gonna do a little similar thing on this one, but maybe I'm just gonna do some orange with some of this black wash dirty paint water that I have and just go over this with a little bit more muted of an orange because of my black wash mixture. Yep. And then on this one, <clears throat> maybe I'll get a clean side and just kind of dab it. Different, different subtle effects you can create. Just gonna dab it. Oops, so we got some paint on the other side of this one. Wipe that off. So I'm just gonna dab it. And it might not look like much, but these little tiny layers of subtle things, even though they don't look too crazy, see how that's adding like spottiness and, and humidity and stuff to the glass and uh, unevenness to the, uh, the sheen of the glass or the plastic. That'll make it look all the more real in our diorama. All right, so there is our two windows, two different ways. Again, you can take these concepts and apply them many different ways for different shapes and sizes. Apply them larger, smaller, bigger. You don't have to use cereal box cardboard. You can use other materials like plastics and foam, uh, just paint and weather accordingly. Um, you can use balsa wood. You can use uh, plexiglass, you can use actual glass, but these are just some simple concepts to 
help start you on your way here with creating miniature windows. So I hope you like this tutorial and uh, like, comment, and subscribe. I appreciate the support. Consider becoming a channel member. Channel members always get to see my videos early, except for the toy related videos. Those ones I release when they come out because that's sort of time sensitive information. So I just drop those when they're done. But uh, channel members get to see these videos early and I share with them lots of update posts on what I'm working on that uh, nobody gets to see except them uh, until it's finished. People get to see it at the end. So anyways, thank you guys for being here. I appreciate you very much and uh, we'll see you in a future video.